And we are called to be joyfully in that fellowship with our Savior, with our Lord, who has united us and made us individually members of his body, the body of Christ. Uh, and being receiving that joy, we are then called to be in mission with that joy. One of Pastor Winger's uh, points in his sermon a moment ago was that the end of that parable doesn't end with an empty banquet hall. It ends with his servants, the master's servants, going out and inviting people in to participate in the joy that they know will be in their master's house when that marriage celebration gets into full swing. We are called to be those servants. We are called to be in mission. And we are called to that mission. We are called to be joyfully about that mission that our Savior has given us. When you hear the word mission, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Where does mission happen? Pardon? Well, and, and praise God for that answer. Well, that's where it, mission happens where you are. But your first thought often is not mission here, but missionaries going out into all parts, parts of the world. So your mission perspective often is happening out there rather than here. Uh, when you hear the word mission or the mission committee in your congregation, what is it that your mission committee is often charged to do? You come up with an evangelism program. You come up with a way to train people to go out into the highways and byways and to knock on doors and have a set speech that you will give at that cold call that you do on that knocking of that door so that you have a way of bringing the gospel to those people that you are called to, to um, um, share that good news with, share that invitation with. Uh, so mission in our mindset often is tied to an evangelism program or tied to a speech that we are trained to give. And finally, if you're talking about district missions, What's the first thing that comes to every district tr congregation treasurer's mind? It's money. The money that you send to the district for the district to do missions. And I charge you to hear a different concept when we look at the scripture verses that talk about mission. That it isn't happening in far off countries, it's happening here, as Mr. Colley said. And it isn't an evangelism program that we train ourselves to do, but instead it is a, a, a calling that Christ has laid on each of our hearts to engage in where he has placed us in every moment of our lives. And it isn't so much about the money that you send to the district. Don't let President Abel or Daryl Holland hear me say that. <laughs> but... It is much more the actions that we take as we go out to the streets and invite people in to celebrate with us in the places where he has blessed us with such joy in the house of the Lord, in the divine service. This is the definition that uh, the Lutheran Encyclopedia gives to mission. This term defines the activity of bringing the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ to people everywhere through word and deed, the obligation of the church collectively and of its members individually. So according to that definition, how are we to go about the mission work that our Lord Jesus has given us? What's the thing that we are to do? What do we do? Pardon? We do it collectively and individually, but what do we do? We bring the gospel. We bring the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to whom? People everywhere. And how do we do that? Two ways. Word and deed. And, and who is to do it? The church does it together. We, the district, do it together. We, our synod, Lutheran Church Canada, do it together. 
but it is also a call upon each of us individual members of our church to engage in that mission. And why? Because our Lord has given us that celebration and he has put into our hands the invitation to that celebration. And he calls us to go out with that invitation and pass that invitation out to all. So what does the Bible actually say about mission work? From Acts chapter 12, verse 25, when uh, Paul and Barnabas had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark, John Mark. The word in Greek for, that is translated mission in this passage is the word diakonion, which is uh, the root word for our, our um, office of deacon that we include in our, uh, in our working of our church as church, church workers in our synod. Uh, it, it's an emphasis on the, on the focus on service and a focus on what we do together as God's people. We uh, engage in serving. Paul and Barnabas finished their service to God's people as they went out for that mission journey. Um, and um, so the, the emphasis is on serving. Uh, so service is a part of mission work. In our Lutheran Church, our Lutheran Women's Missionary League, Canada, they uh, uh, have one of their major projects is to work on uh, uh, doing acts of mission service. They too connect those two perspectives. Uh, so as in, in any of you LWML folks, mission service involves the collection of, of soup labels and stamps. Mission service involves the uh, making of layettes and quilts. The mission service involves all kinds of physical activities to meet the needs of others around them and in doing so proclaim, uh, uh, do it out of our love for our Savior and his love for us, but proclaim the name of Jesus as we send these gifts to those who are in need of them. It is mission, it is service. Second place that often, the second word that often gets translated as mission in the scriptures is apostele. Then we get that word for our word for the apostles, the 12 apostles. They are those who are sent out. And here in Acts chapter 4, but Jesus told them, I must tell the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well. That is my mission. That's not Acts chapter 4, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, I, the uh, here, oh uh, yes, I'm sorry. But I must, I must. Uh, uh, it's one of the gospels. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jesus says, "It's my mission to go out. I have been sent to do that." With that perspective on mission, it is not someone taking it on themselves to do this work. It is something that they are being sent to do and being sent out by another. In this passage, in the Gospels, Jesus is saying, the Father sent me to do this. This is my mission. As he sends out his disciples, it is their mission that he sends them to do. Uh, another word that is often translated into, into the word mission in the scriptures is the word ergon or energeia. Uh, meaning energy and work. So the first passage in Acts chapter 15, that Paul did not think it was right to take John Mark with them because he had not stayed with them to the end of their mission, but he had taken them, but he had turned back and left them in Pamphylia. St. Paul is referring to his mission work as work. Uh, with that regard, a Christian's mission is hard work. It's not leisure activity. It's not a hobby that we can take up or lay down as time permits. It is our vocation. It is our calling to be engaged in the work that our Savior has given us. Translating the word energeia or energized work, effective work. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, in spite of the fact that there are many opponents, a big and productive opportunity has opened up for my mission here. 
for my effective work, for my energized work. There it is connected to God's word and his spirit and that those two gifts that God pours out into his people are what energize the work that our Savior gives us to do as he calls us to be engaged in mission. Words that are uh, also translated as mission uh, include a, a dromon, which is uh, translated, or a word that means the, the course of your life or the whole journey of your life. And uh, so the purumama, uh, puruomai, uh, is the second one, that whole journey of life. In Acts, Paul calls the whole course of John the Baptist's life his mission, John's mission. And in Acts chapter 20, he says the same thing about his own life, that his whole life is about mission the whole course and reason for his journey. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, uh, in, is, uh, Saul's going to Damascus to round up the followers of Jesus are referred to as his journey of his life, the, the reason for his being. And in Acts chapter 26, Paul also refers to that, that time of his, um, his life's work before his conversion as the, 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 what he was putting his heart and soul into. Um, so mission is to engage the whole of our lives, not simply just one pigeonhole of our life on Sunday morning, or not just one pigeonhole of our life in, in, our, in our spiritual life, as opposed to our life on the sports field or our life at work. It is to be a, the sum, sum and total and, and our whole life is to be in, in, engaged in that mission work. When I was looking at things to put together for this presentation, I looked at some texts that are recommended for mission festivals. And I expected to find the Great Commission, or I expected to find Jesus sending out the 72. Uh, but instead, I found some very different Text. From Exodus chapter 36 and 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Exodus chapter 36 is the people of Israel gathering together all of the all of, uh, offering to Moses all of their uh, gold and silver and precious jewels, all of the things that they had uh, been given by their neighbors when they left Egypt. And, and, and it refers to all of the workers who were called to use their talents and their abilities, all to put together the house of the Lord, the tabernacle, and the furnishings of that tabernacle. So the, the focus, and the first chronicles uh, passage is the, uh, um, uh, the dedication of the building of the temple, uh, Solomon's temple. And so these, and the gathering of all the materials to build that temple, these are mission texts. So when you, so it's not so much an evangelism focus, a, an evangelism program, as a focus on the house of the Lord. Neither of these passages are about evangelism. Both presume that what God gives in the divine service that happens in his house will empower his people to live out his mission in their various vocations. And the nations will see this, and they will be drawn to Yahweh to receive those gifts for themselves. Mission is focused in the divine service, what God gives to his people. And what God gives to his people then gets lived out in the life of God's people. Isaiah chapter 2, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That text is a mission festival text. What is the focus? The mountain of the Lord. 
The mountain of the Lord is equated with the house of the God of Jacob. What happens in the house of the God of Jacob is equated with the people of God in Christ. Now a New Testament context put on that Old Testament passage. And we, the house of the God of Jacob, the people of God in Christ, are the church. The mission, and what happens in that passage with the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, what happens with God's people is fleshed out by Martin Luther in this great quote. The kingdom of Christ has been put in progress because it is placed in public view with all its powers and its gifts. Here one sees truth, pure doctrine, safety, peace. The gospel is heard, and nothing can give greater joy. Notice where mission takes place? In the house of the Lord. For it is promised an abundance of things and salvation both here and hereafter. And a man stands safe in the word against everything that opposes him, even the gates of hell. Behold, these virtues should influence the nations to make them come. Notice there is the mission emphasis. The nations will come because they see the virtues of God's people lived out because of what happens in the house of the Lord, on the mountain of God. They are proclaimed through the word, namely that Christ is the king of mercy and of peace. Moses preaches the law and is the minister of sin and death. Nobody runs to him. On the contrary, they are terrified. Christ, on the other hand, is the minister of righteousness, of life and peace. Therefore, the people flow to him just as water flows by its own effort and no one needs to push it. So, what happens when you engage in the mission that our Savior gives you? Other people will see that. And they will flow to, not to you, but to him, to Jesus, just as water flows by its own efforts. If you engage in the mission that our Savior gives you, the people that you speak to, nobody will need to push them into church. They will see Christ and be drawn to him. What is the mission to which Christ calls us? to be the kingdom of Christ, according to what Martin Luther just said. So we to be, uh, and we be that kingdom of Christ where the world can see truth, pure doctrine, safety, and peace. That happens here in God's house. The kingdom of Christ is where the gospel is heard and with its promises of salvation, safety, mercy, and peace. Again, that's what happens in God's house. The kingdom of Christ is where Christ is proclaimed as the minister of righteousness, life, and peace. That happens here in God's house. And the result, the people will flow to Christ, just as water flows by its own effort. In Luke chapter 24, Jesus said, gave us a picture of mission. He said, thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What, according to that Bible verse, is Christ's mission? It's to suffer and die, and on the third day rise from the dead. Christ's mission. What is our mission? To proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins to the nations in Jesus' name. Why should we do that according to what Jesus said in Luke's gospel? Because you are witnesses of these things. How are you a witness of these things? You are witnesses of Christ's death and resurrection here at his altar. You are witnesses of that because he gives you his body and his blood to eat and to drink. You are witnesses of Christ alive from the dead who lives in you. You are wit through his, that sacrament of the altar. You are witnesses of these things, Christ's death and resurrection, 
through the power of his word that is proclaimed to you. You are witnesses of those things as Christ comes to you in his word of life, in his body and his blood, in that divine service. And how do we engage in that mission? Through the power from on high with which you have been clothed. That happened to the disciples on Pentecost. That happened to you in your baptism. In our uh, Lutheran, or in the Lutheran Study Bible, in reference, in commenting on that passage from Luke chapter 24, it quotes Martin Luther saying, it's as if Jesus would say to you, I'll place my whole armor on you that will withstand every shot. So often we're afraid to engage in the mission that our Savior has given us. We're afraid we don't have the, the abilities or the words or the, or the talents or the strength or the thick skin that might, we might need in order to uh, withstand whatever the world might throw at us. But Jesus says, I will clothe you with power from on high. I will send you my Holy Spirit. I will put upon you the whole armor of God. And those gifts are there so that you will withstand every shot that the world can give you. Now, that's mission. What comes to mind as you think about the word joy? Perhaps a smiling, happy face and lots of laughter? A nice emoticon at the end of your email verse? Perhaps your favorite Christmas carol. As soon as you hear the word joy, what comes to mind? Oh, come on, say! Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Absolutely, that's joy. And perhaps it's also, here in this place, a church full of Lutherans singing mightily, a mighty fortress is our God, a trusty shield and weapon. That's joy. The Theopedia, an online encyclopedia of biblical Christianity, defines the word joy in this way. It's a state of mind and an orientation of the heart. Notice where joy is. It's not on your face, it's in your heart and in your mind. It is a settled state of contentment, confidence, and hope. Joy isn't a smile or a laugh. Joy is something that is deep within and doesn't leave quickly. When we have the joy of the Lord, we'll know it and so will others. That's joy. This is Jesus' joy. One of the best descriptions of Christ's joy comes not in the Gospels, but in Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. The joy of the Lord is Christ's strength. What was that joy that he was talking about? The joy that was set before him. The joy that was before him as he left his throne on high and was incarnate of the Virgin Mary was the salvation that would be won through his suffering and death and resurrection. The joy of the Lord, the joy that was put before him was your salvation and mine that we would be with him in eternity in the heavenly home he's preparing for us. It's that joy that motivated him to leave his throne on high, to not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but make him willing to give that all up and become nothing, taking on the form of a servant. The joy of the Lord is your strength. <clears throat> Nehemiah chapter 8. It is a settled state of contentment, confidence, and hope. And it is something deep within you, and it doesn't leave quickly. 
That's the joy of the Lord. Not some fleeting happiness or some euphoria that comes because of some thing or some event or, or whatever. It doesn't leave quickly. His gift of the Holy Spirit bears its fruit in our lives. The gift of faith, which trusts the Word of God in all of its parts, both law and gospel. It's that state of mind and orientation of the heart founded firmly in Christ our Lord, and that becomes more and more evident to those around us as the joy of the Lord in its strength grows in us. It's that last phrase that gets us thinking about the connection between joy and being in mission. As we engage in the gifts that our Lord gives us and put them into practice in our lives, as the Holy Spirit bears his fruit in us, the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, etc., as those things happen in our lives and we engage with those gifts, engage in the working out of those gifts and living out of those gifts in our lives, it will become more and more evident to those around us whose joy it is that is in us. We bear Christ's name. I talked about the 72 a minute ago. After they had been sent out, they returned to Jesus with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. The 72 had been in the mission field. They had been engaged in the mission Christ had, been, had given them. And they saw God at work in everything that they were doing. And they returned to Jesus filled with the joy of seeing Christ at work his word and his power, his name and its power, as they lived out that power in the mission that they had been given. And then Jesus shared in their joy. Can't you just imagine the joy in his words as Jesus responded to them about seeing the devil's grip on humanity loosened through the proclamation of the kingdom? He said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. One of my favorite passages. These things I have spoken to you, Jesus said, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. When we hear and receive his word, joy is created. Jesus' joy. A joy that's full and complete. It's a gift that comes as Jesus speaks his word to us. Christ's word brings that joy to those who hear it. Both we hear it here and those who hear it from us and who see it in action in us. In doing that, we are joyfully in mission. Another favorite passage of mine. You have sorrow now, but I will see you again, Jesus said, and your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. What is it that caused the disciples' sorrow to turn into joy in that passage? What is it that turned the disciples' sorrow into joy? Well, what made them sorrow in the first place? Jesus' death. And Jesus death. What brought them joy again? Jesus' resurrection. Jesus alive from the dead. It's seeing their Lord and Savior alive and risen from the dead. And now that they have seen the risen Christ, nobody can rob them of that joy. You have seen Christ. 
in his real presence, in, in his body and his blood, on the altar of Holy Communion, in that wedding banquet of his word and sacrament that he invites us to each Sunday. You have seen the risen Christ. No one can rob you of that joy. In Acts chapter 15, so being sent on their way by the church, Paul and Barnabas passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they brought great joy to all the brothers. What is it that brought joy? What is it that they did as they were engaged in Christ's mission? Was telling other people about what God was doing as he brought salvation to the Gentiles. That brought joy to everyone who heard it. So not only are we joyfully in mission, when we go out and engage in that mission that our Savior gives us, when we go out and live, the, live out the gifts that God gives us in the divine service, but we bring joy to others who are brothers and sisters in Christ when we tell them about God at work in our daily lives as we engage in that mission as we see Christ at work in the lives of those around us. A pastor just told me yesterday, he said, I've lived in this neighborhood for a long time, and I've had this neighbor family living just two doors down, and they've lived there as long as we have. All of a sudden, they had a problem in their, in their family, and one of their kids who had moved away and come back said, why don't you go over and talk to the people who live in that house? He's a pastor. This family's Muslim. So the family did. They went over and they talked to this pastor and his family. And they, he counseled them, prayed with them, talked to them about the, the, their need for Christ to be in the midst of their crisis situation in their family. And they went home. Weeks later, they came back to that pastor's home and said, we want to be baptized. Praise the Lord for the ways he works as he converts the Gentiles even today. We are joyfully in mission when we bear witness to God in action in our lives. When we have a ready answer when others ask us about the reason for our settled state of contentment, our confidence and our hope that our Savior gives us. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 puts together joy and the mission work that God's people are called to. When Paul says, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. What joy is there for Paul as he sees the people that he has ministered to and he has borne witness to through the word of God, as he sees them standing firm in their faith. And that brings him joy. And it brings joy to all those that he shares that good news with about the Corinthians standing firm in their faith. For in the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. So often we separate affliction and joy. If we're going through something, how can I be joyful? If we have some kind of terrible thing going on in my life, that robs me of my joy. Well, it may rob me of the smile on my face, but it cannot rob me of the joy that God's word gives me, as Jesus promised me. It cannot rob me of my settled confidence that I have in my faith that was created in my baptism. And so there can be affliction, there can be severe testing, but in the midst of that severe testing, Paul is saying these folks had abundant joy. And even in extreme poverty, that joy overflowed in generosity. And they expressed that joy in the gifts they shared. Joy doesn't have to be diminished when trouble comes. 
joy in times of affliction, in fact, becomes a powerful testimony to how God is at work among us. So they see that joy, that settled confidence, even when I'm having trouble and my neighbors are pointed to Christ, who is my strength, the joy that I have in the Lord. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And in that, you became an example to all the believers in the whole region. The Apostle John writes about joy and mission as well. He says, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink, Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face with you so that our joy may be complete. The joy happens in face to face communication. Actually, the Greek says mouth to mouth communication. And I don't think that's a nice kiss. I think that's, <laughs> that's speaking face to face and sharing that good news, that joy that is our strength, the joy of the Lord. He then also says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So not only does Paul need to share with them the good news of God in action in his life and the good news that he has laid upon them, John actually also, having shared that good news with them and let his, God's word have an effect in their lives, is, is receives even greater joy when he hears back from them that they are walking in the truth. It's a two-way communication. God's word goes out, and God's word is in action, and the good news comes back, and the joy is on both sides. Paul's greatest joy comes from hearing that his members of his congregation are faithfully engaged in the mission of the church. So part of the joyful mission we have, that we have been called to, is to bear witness to each other. Christ at work. We're encouraged and the joy in us is built up when we see Christ and his love at work in each other. And Jesus in us and in our fellow Christians around us we can bear up and not grow weary and not lose heart, not be robbed of his joy as we go about his mission. Being engaged in Christ's mission is first and foremost about the word, God's word. Getting God's word into the hearts and ears and lives of God's people. So it is vitally important that as we engage in that mission that Christ's given us, that we become more biblically literate ourselves. How can you tell others what you yourself don't have a handle on? So be diligent and regular in Bible study, in your personal and family devotion. And more than that, memorize whatever you can. Just the other day in devotions in, our, in the district office, we were talking about um, Alzheimer's patients and how that as we engage, in, uh, in, engage them, uh, the nursing staff in the nursing homes will often not be able to communicate with them, but the pastor can go in and just begin the Lord's Prayer and they will just continue the Lord's Prayer word for word with the pastor singing the hymns that are favorites of theirs, speaking the scriptures that are precious to them, reciting with the pastor the Apostles' Creed, and how memorization was so important in the lives of, of God's people in your generation and mine and in generations in the past, and how that memorization emphasis has kind of gotten lost in in the generation are two younger than myself. And I wonder if when those generations who haven't had the, the emphasis put on memorization 
haven't had that word sinking deeply into their heart through scripture recitation and through music and hymns. I wonder how we are going to be able to, how is their pastor going to be able to engage them in their dimension? Memorization. Enrich. And begin with your favorite. Becoming more biblically literate is only the first step. What do you do with God's Word? Hand it out. We have several Bibles at home, small, uh, small pocket Bibles, full Bibles, and we're ready at a, at a drop of a hat. They're always in our car. They're always in our, in our hands. Wherever we have the opportunity to share that good news of God with, God's, with the people that we meet. Uh, hand out individual Gospels, New Testaments, whole Bibles, whatever you can get your hands on. Volunteer with the Lutheran, Bibles, uh, Lutheran Bible Translators Canada. Bi volunteer with the Gideons or Bibles for Missions or the Canadian Bible Society. Engage God's people in, in, in or engage the people around you in receiving God's Word. Be generous with your distribution of that Word. Let the Bible verses pepper, or as you'll hear in the Gospel, uh, in the gospel lesson tomorrow in many of your churches, Salt God's, the world with God's word. And let God's word salt your everyday conversation. And make it obvious that the Bible is the foundation for your morality and your ethics. That you as God's people live differently because of the word of God that is implanted and growing and, and thriving in your heart and soul and mind. And as you get God's word into people's minds and ears and hearts, do this all with joy, trusting that God will use his word to share and to accomplish his purpose. I ask you, what brings joy to you in your church? As you enter into those doors, what brings you joy? Constantly being reminded of the absolute promises of salvation. Ah, absolutely. The promises of salvation. God's word is spoken to you. What gives you joy in God's house? Worshiping God, singing the songs of our church. Ah, singing God's word, worshiping him. Yes, yes. And, and, Alone? Are you alone when that's happening? No. Yeah. Joy is also a part of, uh, in, 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 it comes to us in, in, in that engaging in that process of worship with er, that experience and celebration of worship with others, with my brothers and sisters in Christ. What brings you joy as you enter into God's house? Yeah, hearing those wonderful words, you are forgiven all your sins. Yeah, those wonderful words of absolution that uh, assure me that the waters of baptism have again flooded away the sins that I have committed. Ah, coming to the Lord's table. Yeah. Nico, you missed Pastor Winger's sermon this, this evening. It was just great. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That, that wonderful joy that we receive at the table. And then uh, my favorite part, and not just because it's the end of the service. It used to be because then I get to go home. But the benediction. <laughs> you hear those words of the benediction. And uh, to know that God's name has been put upon me again. And those blessings of, of uh, God's smiling face, his countenance shining upon me, his, his blessings surrounding me and filling me, and his peace. What a wonderful gift and wonderful way to close off that time of, of celebration and being in that marriage feast that gives us a foretaste of the feast that's in heaven. 
If those are the things that give you joy, those are probably the same things that keep you coming back. And if those are the things that give you joy and keep you coming back, then proudly bear Christ's name everywhere around you. Let that joy be expressed in your word and deed to those around you as you engage in the mission that Christ has given. Worship with joyful passion. Pastors, model passionate engagement in worship so that what's happening up here reflects the joy of the Lord in your heart. And your people, as they see you impassionately engaged in that worship celebration, will experience that joy of the Lord as well. Reflect the meaning of the words that you speak and you sing as you lead the liturgy and, and proclaim the scripture. Remember that God is forgiving his people, speaking to his people, engaging his people, loving his people through you, pastors. So worship with joyful passion so that the joy of the Lord is evident in your ministry. Because you embody Christ's mission. Lay people, engage joyfully in worship. Expect God to impact you as you enter into his house, to be present to you, and to pour out upon you his gifts in that divine service. It is a place of passion, that joyful celebration. And get your whole family to engage, actively participating in that whole service, the liturgy, the confession of the creed, the confession of our sins, the, the speaking of the liturgy and the, the responses to our prayers. Let give, encourage your whole family and from young kids on to passionately engage in worship. It is a joyful experience. It is not something that we apathetically sit in the pews and just Oh, endure. Participate with your guests in worship. Help them to follow along with the liturgy. Answer the questions they have about the sanctuary. Introduce them to your pastors and elders and other members. But get those people that have joined you and answered your invitation to come to worship, engage with them so that they understand your experience of worship as the joy of the Lord being your strength and are, are eager to receive that same thing that you have. Your church family needs no apology. Regardless of the number of people that are gathered in your sanctuary on a Sunday morning, be it small number or large number, it needs no apology. If what you confess as bringing you joy as you enter God's house, if that is truly your experience, then no matter, and if that's the way God pours out his gifts through word and sacrament in your life, Trust him to work in the same way with those people that you would invite to share with you in that worship time. And as you invite others to join you in worship, and they respond to that invitation, isn't that going to increase the number of people that are gathered together and will engage in that joyful celebration? together. You don't need to feel like those who come into your house, into the Lord's house, um, well, never mind. <laughs> but proudly bear Christ's name. 
so that as you invite people to worship with you, they see you proudly bearing the name of Christ as you worship him at his, in his house and at his table. Invite people to worship with you. Invite everyone. I, the sermon I preached not too long ago talked about it, it was when the, that passage from James was the epistle lesson that talks about you know, the, the rich man comes into your, into your worship place and you give him the best seat in the house, but the poor man comes in and you say, sit over there. Well, we often, I, mean, I don't anticipate that we would do that in our worship or we would hope we wouldn't. But I think that part of our, our mindset is that, well, you know, the CEO of my company probably wouldn't get much out of my humble congregation. Or the, the conductor of the local symphony orchestra probably is too highfalutin for us uh, Lutherans in this rural community. Um, but why wouldn't God, don't they need the same thing that God gives to you in his house? And in the same way with those uh, on, on, that we meet on the street, uh, uh, the, the person on the street corner uh, who is uh, there strumming his guitar and singing quite out of tune, um, but is desperate for something to, uh, to feed his family with. Uh, doesn't he too need? And I think maybe in our minds we would wonder how our congregation might react if they walked into the door. And maybe also, maybe in a real far corner of our mind, might wonder, well, how are my friends going to think about me if they come with me to church on Sunday? But, you know, isn't that exactly the opposite of being engaged in the mission that our Savior has called us? And isn't that exactly the opposite of what Pastor Winger shared with us from that parable? Who does the Lord invite? And do this all trusting that God will use his word proclaimed to accomplish his purpose in the lives of all who enter your house of worship. It's joyful. Skipping rope. <laughs> in a recent Canadian Lutheran article, Pastor Summers wrote, Noticeable in the immigration-fed membership at his congregation in Montreal. The trend is that hearing from friends and acquaintances is the means by which most people come to French-speaking churches. Outreach through distribution of flyers, events, and deliberate general outreach, except perhaps through the website, have negligible results. It is through personal invitation, through personal contacts. It is through inviting those people that have a relationship with you. Those are the ones who will re receive your invitation and come. Relate what you have come to know through your experiences of God's grace. Liturgically, as you shared a moment ago, your release and your joy at hearing the words of absolution. Your joy at being reminded of your baptism in the invocation and in the sign of the cross. Your encouragement and comfort and faith building that you got from Sunday's sermon. The blessings that you received through Jesus' body and blood. Share how God has impacted your life in the passionate worship of that celebration. Relate to those who you meet in your connections, in your social circles in your families, in your workplaces, in your classrooms, everywhere. Tell what the Lord is doing as you receive his gifts of grace. And not only here in the divine service, in your daily living, how God has comforted, encouraged you, and empowered you through his word. How the music of the church affects you. Share with others what God is doing in your life. Participate in Christ's mission through prayer. Pray for your pastors. Pray for the missionaries of our district. 
Pray for the missionaries we send abroad. Pray for those who are working in Christ's mission in your own community. Pray. These people need your prayers lifted up to God to encourage them in the work that they do. Pray for unbelievers. Pray for those that you are hoping will in receive your invitation and come to worship. Pray for your Muslim neighbor down the street that you may have the same kind of opportunity to speak about Christ with them that the pastor I shared with you the story of a minute ago had with that, upper, that neighbor of his. Pray for those around you. And our world, our communities, our classrooms, our workplaces are filled with unbelieving people who are desperate to have a difference worked in their lives that Jesus can do. Pray with con joyful confidence to him who answers prayer. Our synodical theme for this year, come to him who answers prayer. That is God's promise. He hears and he answers. And then, as you engage in Christ's mission, relax. Because the growth is God's responsibility. Paul said, I plant and Apollos waters. God gives the growth. So relax and enjoy the ride. Be joyful in engaging in the mission our Savior has given to us because the responsibility for the outcome is God's. Our own district's theme, rejoice always. Give thanks in all circumstances. Pray without ceasing and joyfully proclaim Christ crucified. That is engaging in Christ's mission. May the Lord encourage us, build us up, and give us that joy to word, sacrament, the fellowship we have with him. The Lord be with you all. Amen. Amen. Any questions? I've been doing all the talk, most of the talk. Go ahead. I'm sorry? If you have no joy, I didn't get the last part still, the belief in Christianity. There's a leak. There's a leak, yes. Yeah. And we can't blame that on the Chinese, can we? <laughs> That's right. Jesus said, I have spoken this to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. Yes? This might not be a question, but Father Thomas, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a very strong belief that the Bible is not the only Engage with those that you invite. Absolutely. Yeah. 
How they thought. You're all anxious for wine and cheese. <laughs> Thank you for the privilege of sharing this with you this evening. Thank you for enduring with me instead of Jonathan Fisk, and he is eager to share with you tomorrow. God bless you all.